<laughs> All right. All righty. Well, thank you so much for taking your time today. Um, would you mind introducing yourself for the people that we have watching, maybe your name, your role, and a little bit about what you do for East St. Louis? Okay. Well, my name is Dwayne Stewart. I'm the operations manager for the finance department for the city of East St. Louis. Um, that role, again, is like right below the finance director. Mm -hmm. So my main responsibilities are uh, monthly reporting, bank reconciliations, check, well, accounts payable checks, uh, payroll, wire transfers, financial statement preparation, liaison for the auditors whenever we have external auditors. The list just kind of goes on, dealing with budgets. So yeah, anything <laughs> just kind of financially related. Yeah, I, I have a part in it. Okay, well, it sounds like you got your hands in a lot of different things, which is great because that means you probably have a really good understanding of the city and what else going on from the community. So uh, what do you, in, in your role, believe is special or unique about East St. Louis? Well, the one thing that I will say as far as the financial role that I think is especially unique about the city of East St. Louis is the fact that, unfortunately, since the population has declined so much, the city is a home rule municipality. Um, and I'll go into home rule later on and kind of explain that. But yeah, I mean, the city's definitely rich in history. There's been a lot of, I would say major companies that used to be here and you still have some of those remnants such as Monsanto, uh, American Water, which is a big contributor as far as with the city, a good community partner, uh, Ameren, uh, and just the fact that, I mean, the, the, the I mean, I, I, there's just so much that's coming to mind and I just don't wanna kind of put my thoughts in order. It's with those major corporations that used to be here and some of the major corporations that are no longer here, just kind of the remnants of them. Mm -hmm. um, you start to have an understanding as far as like why the city was built, why it was structured the way it is. And you start to understand why the, cop the population has shifted the way it is, but you know, some of the promising things that are definitely coming up on the horizon as well. Now, I know you said there that some industries may have left the area and there's some industries that are still there. Can you tell us a little bit about that shift and what some of the main industries in East St. Louis right now are? Okay, so I'll start with one of them. Monsanto. So Monsanto used to definitely be a very big corporation that was a good community partner in the city. Unfortunately, during the time frame that they were here, I mean, wasn't the best of practices that they did as far as with uh, how they were running their organization. And unfortunately that did contribute to some environmental issues that unfortunately that was left with the city to deal with. Um, they, from my understanding, they definitely ended up leaving uh, for two reasons. One, um, as far as from a city standpoint, of course, when it comes time to raising taxes and things like that, just like any other municipality in Illinois, they felt like, you know, the taxes were kind of high as far as for them to do business. So they saw a better opportunity as well as from the city's perspective. Uh, some of the things, of course, that they were doing from a corporation responsibility standpoint was not very conducive for the city moving forward. So that's why they ended up leaving at some particular point in time. So that's one major corporation. Another major corporation is uh, the railroads. Mm -hmm. uh, the railroads definitely do play a good part in as far as in the uh, contribution of revenue for the city of East St. Louis. Um, at one particular point in time, it definitely was a sizable hub and it definitely generated more revenue. And I wanna say just like any other, I wanna say mid-size town at that time, I wanna say, East St. Louis, again, as well as other municipalities, tried to raise taxes because, of course, they're like railroads, they have money. So, of course, <laughs> they're going to generate additional revenue. And are these and, commercial or passenger railroads? Uh, commercial. Okay. And that's why the state of Illinois, uh, I want to say back in the 70s, like maybe 1972, 75, and, uh, ended up enacting a replacement tax. Mm -hmm. Um, that way municipalities wouldn't, you know, overburden these corporations or organizations and of course unfairly tax them. And then that way the city still gets a reasonable sizable amount of taxes, but we don't also unfairly burden, you know, our corporate partners as well. 
Yeah, because you don't want them to leave either. Right. Because oh, yeah. Tax bills can be scary at the end of the day. Yes. <laughs> okay. So bringing it a little bit closer to today, can you tell us a little bit about how East St. Louis, especially financially, handled the pandemic? Were there any major changes to the way that you raised revenue or the ways that you had to adjust spending? <laughs> so um, I will definitely say ways to adjust spending. Um, it definitely required a lot of creative thinking, I would say, on the parts of the uh, employees here. It, you started to see other departments kind of go into like areas that they're normally not responsible for in order to lend aid, such as like, and I'll just go for example, my role is definitely not purchasing, but if purchasing needed assistance, we, you know, we would lend resources or whatever we needed to do in order All to- All hands on deck, yeah. Exactly. And that's what it ended up doing as far as related to the pandemic. Uh, as far as spending, that was definitely, it was, I want to say the, the spending was not, not, not so bad. I mean, the city was always kind of pretty frugal with the money. Oh, am I saying that right? <laughs> I mean, I use frugal. They were very conscientious <laughs> on <Yeah>. their spending. <laughs> they were very conscientious on their spending. So I don't think that was ever an issue. I think the biggest issue was getting the citizens and the staff on board as far as like, hey, this is a pandemic, you know, let's, let's go about this properly. And I wanna say the, the biggest challenge in that was not so much from the city hall perspective was that part wasn't so much challenging. It was more so trying to make sure that these businesses that have definitely been around for a number of years that have, been very successful in the community, making sure that they were continue to be open or successful and, you know, continue to be around because, you know, just as well as they love the city, we love them being businesses within the community as well. So Especially I would say that- Lawyers in the city of, of the people yes, working there. That was, that, what well, I would say that was the biggest challenge. Like, it was definitely- kind of difficult to make sure that people's morale stayed up and you know help is on the way and you know just you know trust in the system mm -hmm. so so i know you probably know a lot about the tax history of east st louis and i know my students have gone through many of the previous financial records at this point trying to look at what all's been there and how there are different ways of raising funds when funds are needed and i know part of the mm -hmm. project that my students are working on is coming up with new ideas for potential forms of tax revenue that would not adversely impact the marginalized communities that may be in the area. Can you tell us a little bit about sort of the history of taxes in East St. Louis? What, what are some interesting ways that uh, things you may raise revenue or things that you think might be kind of unique to the area when it comes to tax financing? So I'll go back. Yeah, I'll definitely go back a ways. So I'll go back several years. This is before I was even born. When the city was, you know, it had a population of about a hundred thousand people. So, oh wow, I didn't know it was ever that big. Yeah, it was it was very huge. The, the city of East St. Louis was the largest city outside of Chicago for for a long period of time. Oh wow, that's super cool. I didn't know that. Yes. So um of course you had more housing, you had more residents, you had more uh, organizations that were here, so you had a bigger community base. So the taxes were a lot better, of course. So you you could spread the taxes around. Property taxes weren't as high, so you had a bigger base to spread the I don't call it a burden, but the tax burden around, so that you know it was a a very viable community at that time. So of course you had things that have happened throughout history. We'll kind of just get past that, and it ended up causing community. Well, the, it caused the population within the community to decline. Mm -hmm. So we'll fast forward to more recent things. So we'll go back to the early 90s when, hey, you know, the state of Illinois was considering, hey, we want to do gaming. We want to do gaming taxes. The city of East St. Louis was one of two municipalities that were able to secure uh, a gaming license. Mm -hmm. So that gave a really big boost to the community. Um, okay. It became, it was, uh, I want to say the city had 
like maybe before the gaming tax, maybe a 13 to 15 million dollar general fund budget. Okay. Uh, with the gaming, once that took off initially, that added another $12 million. Wow, so, that so was basically on, doubled, y'all. Yeah, so doubled, uh, definitely a big boost to the community, definitely a big boost to morale. And it was a riverboat at that particular point in time, so they called it a riverboat gaming license. So that was a big boost. So now we can hire additional people for public safety, both police, fire, and public works. Um, we can do additional projects in the community, start to get some some other projects done, such as streets, sewers, and like just, just normal services that a municipality should provide. So you had those taxes that came in, um, and I would say still piggybacking off of that. And of course, you start to see, of course, like things that have happened in Illinois. Video gaming has been passed, so there's other smaller communities. Sports gambling. Yes. Yeah. So not everyone's coming down to our community in order to, you know, having to gamble. They can go to their local bar, pub, I don't know, this is really stretching, but hair salon, whatever, and just do a <laughs> video gaming there. So, of course, that impacted the amount of taxes that were coming to the city. And I'm but, sure the pandemic must have hurt as well as, as many oh, places were closed down. Oh, yeah. Like, that, that became very challenging for quite some time. <laughs> So what the state of Illinois ended up doing, recognizing the fact that, like, of course, passing those gaming licenses and allowing the video gaming and things like that, uh, and that was a big major revenue contributor to the city, they uh, passed a uh, bill that indicated that, of course, so, and this was recent, like within the last three to four years, okay. where if there's anything new in the area that opens up, so if another casino opens up or anybody that does major gaming the city gets a small portion of that mm -hmm. because again it impacts the amount of revenue that we get so yeah that's something that's definitely unique to the city for sure yeah that's pretty cool especially because i didn't realize the history was so long on some of these pieces so i am going to pause right here and introduce our next person who's come in and um Welcome. Uh, we you're coming in right in the middle of a recording, but that's you're at the great part. We've gotten past the easy questions. Now we're getting into really fun <laughs> questions. Would you mind introducing yourself for the students so they can kind of get your name, your role, your role in the community, and what you find special about East St. Louis? Hi, I am Chanel Claiborne, the director of economic and community development for the city of East St. Louis. Um, I am fairly new to this role. I think I've just hit six months. So I'm I'm still a newbie to all of this. Um, just so new to the city. Learn. <laughs> yes, just new to the city. Not so much to the position. Um, so my department handles a lot. We of course drive economic development for the city of East St. Louis. We drive community development. We have TIF in my department. So we do senior rehab, regular rehab. We do demolition. We do business retention grants, new development, new construction, all those fun things. And of course, look for different ways to bring dollars into the city. Um, I think that right now was a great time to kind of come into the city because we do have quote unquote a renaissance happening right now. Um, we have dollars in the city. We have tons of new development that is about to take place and we really do have a chance to re kind of reshape um, the city of East St. Louis and, and, and put it in a great spot to move forward. Okay, cool, it's pretty neat. So do what do you as an economic developer find really unique and special about the area? East St. Louis has a lot of history um, if you, I mean, you can do the research looking back to how the city used to be such an industrial um, kind of epicenter for the area. And even just down to the character of the buildings that are in the central business district, or even in the Olivet neighborhood or other places that you find in the city, there's so much character, so much history here. And the fun part of my job is trying to figure out how to preserve some of those things while also bringing the city um, into the future. So we're looking at right now becoming a smart city and everything that goes along with that, which is really, really cool. Oh, that's cool. Like yeah. fiber optics. And oh, yeah. All the tech. Oh, that sounds wonderful. <laughs> uh -huh. the, t the solar panels on top of the light posts and all those things are going to be happening in the very near future. So that is very exciting to be a that's part of that right cool. now. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. congratulations. I hope that goes really well and that, and that you're able to get through it uh, with, without much hiccups. Yes, that's the hope. <laughs> My fingers are crossed. <laughs> 
Well, we went through the first couple questions about taxes and revenues in the area. And Dwayne's been nice enough to tell us a little bit about the history of how the industries in the area changed mm -hmm. and how the uh, major spending or major revenue sources has sort of changed, especially about 100 years ago to changes in the 90s to today. Uh, and this question can be for either one of you, but I know we're getting to the tough questions now. Are there any concerns that should be specifically considered when approaching a new type of tax or a new way to raise revenue? I know my students right now are looking into lots Lots of different options, but they also want to make sure to be very intentional to make sure that they're not causing any undue harm with a policy. So are there specific concerns when approaching new revenue sources? So you want to take this first or you want me to? I'll let you go and I'll tag team it. Okay. So the biggest thing that I think should be considered for sure is the the city, well, I'm sorry, however it is that you're going to approach this, yeah. um, it needs to be viewed as far as like what's deemed to be essential. Like, you know, what what is something that a normal municipality or city needs? Is it entertainment? Is it food? Is it medical? It's, you know, what things are needed. So taking the approach, what does the city have versus what does a normal community should have? that should help alleviate some of the burden as far as like something that could perceivably be a burden because a citizen could want to, of course, contribute additional funds for, we'll say an entertainment district, that way they don't have to go to someplace else and they can have fun and spend money within the community. And of course, it just recycles within that same community versus like, hey, I'm just going to raise your property taxes. And of course, that just feels like, okay, well, you're just trying to get more money. Well, especially <laughs> when, when, for example, that. entertainment, entertainment at home, I mean, that keep dollars in the community instead of people going across the river for entertainment venues there and then the money leaving. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'll add to that, though, we are in the process. I'm sure you guys, you, your students may be aware that we do have a, a, a large TIF uh, district two mm -hmm. of them in our area, but we're also look at, we're getting the extensions for those, but we're also looking at a few new TIFs. Um, so we're looking at an entertainment TIF district, actually. Oh, that's neat. Yeah. Uh, my students are still early on in learning about all the different parts of taxes. Would you mind just telling them a little bit about TIF districts, what they are and what they mean for the community? Okay, so for our tax increment financing, um, or is what TIF stands for. But with, with those TIF districts, you are able to take those dollars that for, so let me, well, let me say this. We are very unique in our, in our TIF districts in that we have several taxing bodies. And with those agreements, they were able to kind of pull a significant portion mm -hmm. of um, the tax increment financing that goes out, that does not come to the city. It goes to other, other those other taxing bodies. The school district, it's a large portion of our of our TIF dollars, um, but those dollars kind of are just pulled from your taxes, and it, it locks in your your property taxes at that rate from when they are introduced, and it stays there. Um, so that's kind of a benefit to the city because if the area declines, which is not supposed to do, that you're at least locked in at that rate. Yeah. With, with the new ones though, so we're doing an extension right now for the two large. We have TIF one and we have TIF three. I we are in the process of extending those and getting approval for that, but creating new ones. So we have a new, uh, we're building 21 homes in an area. They're going to be market rate homes. Okay. However, East St. Louis has a very high tax rate. And mm -hmm. to make those homes affordable for people, we're going to put them in a TIF district. And we're going to provide a 75% tax abatement to those who are purchasing those right. homes. So it allows them to be able to buy the home and afford the property taxes that without the abatement would essentially be another mortgage. Now, is your TIF for a certain number of years or, because I know some of them, they might expire, the abatements might expire after 10 years, some are 13, some are 23, some go indefinitely. Well, so the new one will be for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And Dwayne, how long have has TIF 1 and TIF 3? I know that we spent the life of them, but how long have they been around since like 1987 or so? Or uh, it was almost 1990. So okay. yeah, that's about right. Okay. Oh, wow. That's older than me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So can you tell me a little bit, because we've heard a bit about the history of taxes now. Can you tell me what types of taxes the city's been considering and what, what do you really need more information on? I know I have a team of students who are having a great time really analyzing what's there and the different types of revenue that's been there. So what, what things are you considering or would like more information about? 
Well, one thing I know the city is not capitalizing on, it's not so much a tax, but we have a redevelopment that's coming to the central business district. We don't have parking meters that we're using. Nobody pays to park when they come to the city of East St. Louis. Honestly, that sounds wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds wonderful to the consumer before a city that is missing an astronomical amount of money as it pertains Fair point, to fair point. Um, so we are looking at that. I know that's not a tax, but that is something that we're looking at to bring in revenue. Mm -hmm. um, we do at some point there was a billboard tax that I think that we have no longer been enforcing um, mm -hmm. that we need to start back looking at again. I pulled the ordinances for those just kind of figure out what that looks like. Um, okay. We are really in the beginning stages of looking at how to um, and I think the thing is we, we try not to increase taxes. Our, the tax rate is already so high that yeah, we're trying you don't to find want to put other extra creative, burdens on people, yes. but Sometimes we're trying to find creative ways to bring in revenue outside of taxes, 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 because <laughs> they're, already, they're already taxed for, at a pretty high rate at this point. So, oh. And I'll definitely piggyback off of Chanel on that. So just like Chanel indicated, definitely just trying to find creative ways to bring in additional revenue. So, for example, the city is directly positioned right across from St. Louis. Yeah. St. Louis, very big city. Uh, large entertainment hub. Mm -hmm. So the city can do things in order to supplement some of the things that's going on in St. Louis while still keeping our uniqueness. So when they have these large venues or nice events, things like that. So instead of having, we'll say, the larger taxes and fees or estates that you would have in downtown St. Louis. Maybe we can find a way to supplement to where you can have additional housing or and ways to stay in East St. Louis. And then of course, if you, you can choose to just drive over, we have several <laughs> highways that are located yeah. in the city, as well as if you don't want to drive over, you can just uh, take the public transportation. And I mean, just it's go conveniently that way. located, very close to there. lots of different things on both sides of the river. Um, yes. Yeah. Plus, hotel taxes in, in the state of Illinois are pretty interesting and, and a great way that some places are able to raise revenue is if there are more connections to other venues as well, too. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. All right. Well, thank you all so much for telling me about all that. Are there any, um, for, for the purpose of the students who are working through this project and they're, they're trying to research as much as they possibly can into East St. Louis, they've read your most recent census reports, they've gone through tax documents, but are there any resources, data, or financial reports available on the city website that these teams can use as, as they're learning more about East St. Louis and, and the possibilities there? I would say outside of what's already posted there, mm -hmm. Probably not. However, if they're looking for some additional information, um, such as, again, more current information or things that they, you know, that just, they may have a question on that someone such as I or Chanel or someone else, it may just, you know, light bulb goes off. I'm like, oh, okay, well, we can provide them this additional information. The best way to do it would be one, by a FOIA request, or two, just to even reach out to us. That would actually help out greatly. Okay. I, I know some might already be interested in that because, for example, the last census industry report in the area was 2012, and it seems like the businesses or what's located in East St. Louis might have changed drastically since 2012 with new businesses coming in and some leaving, so that would be really informa good information for them to have. Um, so I guess that's the end of my questions, but I know there's still so much to probably talk about. Is there anything that I did not bring up in this interview that either one of you would like would like to highlight about East St. Louis or, or let my students know about? Well, Duane, do I don't know what you covered when you first, because I had an emergency in my office I had to do with, so I don't know what Duane oh, covered gosh. when he first started. Um, but aside from that, I do just want to take a sidebar and extend my apologies for the mix up that happened um, for us missing your class period with the date change and and that hiccup. I was looking I was absolutely looking forward to being in front of you guys and being able to kind of engage with you. So please accept my apologies in the mix up there. Oh, well, thank you for the apology. I, I do appreciate it. I'm sure the students appreciate it. And you're always welcome to come by when we're doing presentations. It might be a lot of fun. Throw them the tough questions.
Okay, I uh, I look forward to that. I'll, I take the, I accept the invite now. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, and the same for you, Dwayne. You're more than welcome to come. Well, at this point, I am going to turn off the record. Well, unless you have more you want to go into, I'm probably going to turn well, off the recording. Well, I'll I'll say this, and it's okay. and it's and it's just because and and Chanel may or may not feel this way, but but because it's like with East St. Louis, it's I mean it's a it's more than just a job or, you know, a place to work. You know, we grew up here, you know, we have family here, received education from here, gone off, you know, received higher forms of education and have come, and have come back and want to improve our community. Yeah. And you hear people say that, but no, everyone that's here literally does have a link and connection and a strong will and desire to improve this community. And just how, you know, we're having this interview right now and just to have, you know, this opportunity to, you know, have a discussion and get additional information to get a better understanding as far as what's going on in this community. That's a big thing that as my, as, as, being, from, as being from East Hamlet, this being my hometown as, as well as working here, we want individuals to know that, you know, the, the city really is trying to improve. You have individuals that are strategically positioned that can definitely affect a change, as well as, you know, it's this, like this, this, what we're doing right now, uh, I hope is a good indication of some of the residents, as well as the individuals that represent the city as far as for how we represent the city as well as, you know, just, you know, what what kind of drive we have for it, so. Yeah, I've noticed there, there's a lot of wonderful and amazing things about East St. Louis that I've, I've learned in just a few weeks that, that we've started looking into this. One, one thing my students mentioned that they've noticed when they read like newspaper articles in the area and stuff like that is it seems that there are families who have been there for a very long time. Yes. And there's there's yeah. a lot of history and a lot of families who have continued there and they don't want to leave, right? Yeah. Uh, they, they would like to make their communities better. So is that something that you both see when, when you're looking at economic development in the area wanting to preserve this history? Yes. yes. Especially if you look at like the Olivet Park area, which is where Catherine Dunham's home is and those things, like there is so much, that is pretty much one of the biggest areas where the most affluent of the city of East St. Louis resided at one point. And if you guys ever get a chance to kind of do a tour and just kind of drive through, you will see the historic homes in the area. You will see the character of them and the quality. You can almost look at them and just imagine, you know, the parties that used to happen there, the business meetings that used to happen there um, and things of the sort. But yes, East St. Louis is a family town. My father has owned his home for 50 years. Oh, wow. Um, and they're still there. You know, I think that and I have the hope that I would be able to move back to the city of East St. Louis as we get more rooftops in the area and things of the sort. Um, but yeah, I absolutely agree with Dwayne. Like we are here because we love the city. Um, we This is home for us. So yes, we left, we could have stayed away, but we've all chosen to come back to affect change in a place that we love so much. Yeah. Uh, you know you know what, there's one other thing and I, and I completely, it just hit me as you were talking, Chanel. If you, like, again, when your students are doing this research, like, you will find that there are a lot of people, famous, wealthy, influential, that have come from here, from Senator Durbin, to Jackie Joyner Kersey, to Miles Davis, to Catherine Dunham, like, I mean, the list just kind of goes on, and I don't, at least that I'm not aware of, like a city that has produced that amount of talent yeah. from such a small base. And like, and those were just a few We have Dunham Hall on campus and I didn't even realize like, yeah. oh, that's, that's definitely yes. probably where the yes. connection is. Yes. We are the city of champions for a reason. For, yes. <laughs> for a reason. And I think that oh, because yeah. we have such, such a rich history, there is a certain level of pride that comes with that. And the things that you are seeing that you've previously seen are not indicative of who we are as a community. And the people who are in place now, we're doing a, our best to change that. 
I mean, it seems like you're working to bring in entertainment to improve yes. things. I and mean, you're talking about being a smart city. That's a huge undertaking to yes. really make things oh, no. efficient and fun and wonderful. So, I mean, it, it sounds like those fun parties at the big houses will be back before you know it. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you both so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Um, I hope that my students are able to do these projects and maybe start to inspire some some new ideas or generate some new ideas too because they just kind of want to help but thank you so much for speaking with us today with that i'm going to go ahead and stop the recording but thank you um and we hope to talk to y'all soon okay right. thank you so much thank for having you. us